This is Anthony Roth Costanzo, countertenor extraordinaire, rehearsing one of the most challenging pieces in opera today. For six straight minutes, he and his fellow castmates have to sing the word ah. Now, that seems easy enough, right? Until you watch it. It's an extraordinary feat that happens roughly one hour into Ignaton, an opera by Philip Glass about this influential Egyptian pharaoh. Anthony plays the lead. Pulling off this opera takes the coordination of hundreds of people. There's dozens of musicians, over 60 performers, including 12 professional jugglers. There's stage designers, makeup artists, a costume with baby heads attached to them, and a giant sun roughly the size of 12 Anthonys. Oh, and the music is in four different languages. This all happens inside this iconic building, the Metropolitan Opera House in Manhattan. Anthony's performed Ignaton with the English National Opera and the Los Angeles Opera, but this one, it's special. I mean, come on, look at this view. It's pretty awesome. And what's even cooler is we get a peek behind the curtain to see how it all happens. So I play Akhenaten, the ancient Egyptian pharaoh, who's a totally fascinating, weird, complex guy. And he has this idea which changes the course of history, which is that instead of hundreds of gods that have existed in Egypt forever, there would be one god, and that would be the sun. He was thus the first monotheist, the first person to worship one god. This opera is like a fever dream of ancient Egypt. And it all starts with the music which wouldn't exist without world-class vocal chords. Go to the middle C, E. These are Anthony's. Someone puts a scope down my throat like this, and then when you breathe, they open up. Should I walk you through some exercises? <laughs> I, was, I was gonna ask the same thing. Do you ever get complaints? I don't actually get that many complaints. I can't hear my own voice the way other ears can because it's buzzing in my head. That's where Joan comes in. It's so much to do with the way we use our breath. She's been his vocal coach since he was 17. But then we have to do it without a lip trail and just starting on a vowel. That's the challenge. thing in the world is the first tone. That first tone is vitally important during every moment of Ignaton, but especially the scenes where all they sing is ah. So that onset that he did with no consonant is real accomplishment, because if he did ha 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 ha, he'd kill himself. To understand how an opera could sound like this, you have to know Philip Glass, perhaps the most famous living composer. Philip Glass is a minimalist, so he uses repetition with changing rhythms and syncopations to create a kind of meditative state. There are a whole lot of arpeggios, meaning a broken chord, so you'll hear ba da 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 ba ba da 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 And a lot of lyrical repetition. In opera, there's a beat, and the time is king. And you can go 90% into your character, but if you go all the way, you might get totally lost. And you can't, you can't afford that. The first step in not getting lost is the Sitzprobe. So the Sitzprobe is a German term which Sitz means sit and Probe means try. This is the first time the orchestra and singers hear what they sound like together after weeks of rehearsing on their own. 
It's a kind of sacred moment, and it's also an exciting moment when you hear the orchestra for the first time, you sing with them for the first time, and in this particular case, it's the Met Orchestra, they're the best. There are two people in this room who keep everyone in check, Karen and Karen. In Western music, we have a tendency to steal time at the end of a phrase. Here it's more about thinking linearly and being really honest about the length of each rhythmic pattern or n individual note. Okay, so we did pretty, pretty well, orchestra. After about three rounds, we start to slow down. So guys playing the off beats, don't listen to anyone because we tend to get slower. I really feel like my job inside the rehearsals is to get inside of the conductor's mind to know exactly what her tempo is. It's hard sometimes for a performance to remember in the moment how many repeats they've done. So there's a lot of counting down measures, a lot of this, which means don't sing, let me do the work for you. I give a lot of positive feedback to them to ensure that they're very comfortable on the stage. Shall I start? Yeah, I think you should say. So, uh, um, yeah, this is an opera with a lot of juggling in it. This is Phelan McDermott and Sean Gandini. He's the director of the opera and he's the juggling master. One thing is the performers are moving really slowly. It's true. Everyone moves in extreme slow motion the entire performance. Like this scene here before Ignaton is killed. Zoom into the right side and you see Ignaton with Nefertiti and their daughters. It's another one of those ah scenes. Move to the left and you see the rest of the cast moving again in slow motion. The only thing moving fast are the balls. Sean um, and Karen spent a long time looking at, at the score and talking about the mathematics of how the juggling relates to the music. I spent a lot of time saying, make sure there's a development. But you send me that script, balls, balls, balls. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. In the middle of the whole show, there's a hymn to the sun, and you basically get the sun god, which, you know, secretly, me and Sean know that actually that's the god of the jugglers. It's the biggest juggling ball. Big mama know. ball. We're about to start, I've got to go. All right, we'll see you later. Thank, Thank you so much. So much. <laughs> this is the moment I realize the Met stops for no one. Hundreds of things are always happening at once, especially at dress rehearsals, where it's all about getting every last detail right. The goal is just to get out of people's way because everything is a timed trial. Over 60 cast members need their makeup done, and there are just a few makeup artists who have two hours to do it. And here's something I haven't mentioned. Anthony enters the opera in slow motion, and he's completely naked. Imagine taking three full minutes to descend 12 steps, looking straight at 4,000 people, and you're totally naked. So it's not just his face that gets makeup, his whole body does. There's also some incredible costumes and wigs. Each individual hair is knotted into a net to make the wig. You don't have to wear a wig. I don't, luckily, have to wear a wig. But he does have to wear this blue headdress, called a capresh, that many Egyptian pharaohs wore to symbolize their royalty. There's always a cobra on the front. It's amazing and also crap. It's like a combo, you know what I mean? Like, this is literally styrofoam from the stage in the lights. It yeah. looks expensive. The real show stealer is this, the baby headdress. If you look at ancient Egypt and the rituals of ancient Egypt, the Book of the Dead, for example, is so fascinating. The things they would do, preserve people's organs, mummify them, weigh someone's heart against a feather in order for them to ascend into the next life. We're representing some of those rituals in our own way, and the shrunken baby doll heads somehow evoke that. Oh, I love that there's a pin. Oh my god, that's where it is! <laughs> The images from the Book of the Dead also served as a visual reference for the multi-level main set, too. The Metropolitan Opera is kind of the 
stage. Did you try singing in the house? Absolutely not, you do it. Ah! That's a nice acoustic. If I told you, you're gonna come see a minimalist three and a half hour opera about ancient Egypt where there's no real story and it's sung in ancient Egyptian, you'd think, man, there's no way I'm going to that. And yet, I bet you're gonna love it.